is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Les Kalman, Bachelor of Science, BSc, DDS, Fellowship in the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, he's got an AA in front of that, Associate Academic Fellow, and a Diplomat in the International Congress for Implantology. He's an Assistant Professor, Restorative Dentistry, Coordinator, Dental Outreach Community Service, President of Research Driven Inc. He completed a BS and DDS at Western, which is a dental school in London, Ontario, followed by a GPR at the London Health Science Center. He maintained a full-time solo private practice with an emphasis on digital dentistry, prosthodontics, and medical device research while continuing hospital privileges at Strathai Middlesex General. His research was supported by the Scientific Research and Experimental Development Fund and the National Research Council. In 2011, Coleman transitioned to full-time academics as an assistant professor and outreach coordinator. His research focuses on medical devices and technologies relevant to clinical dentistry. He has authored close to 40 articles, holds two patents, and has translated two technologies. Dr. Coleman maintains his position as the founder and president of Research Driven. He is an active member of the Academy of Osseointegration, the International Congress of Implantology, the Standards Council of Canada and serves on the Board of Directors for the University of Western Ontario Faculty Association and the Canadian Association of Public Health Dentistry. He has been recognized as an Academic Associate Fellow, AAID, Fellow Master Diplomat of the ICOI, has been awarded the Schulich Alumni of Distinction Award, and most recently the Merck Patients First Award. In his spare time, Dr. Coleman enjoys time with his family, photography, and bikes, um, my gosh, it is such a huge honor to have you on your show. I've been going to your websites and watching YouTube videos at Research Driven Inc. I mean, it's almost like you're a Jedi master in some dental Star Wars show. I don't know if I'll go that far, Howard. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, it's, it's some heavy stuff you guys are working on. Salivary diagnostics, technology. Um, and, and when I got out of school, you know, um, the only thing digital, the, the first digital advancement that I thought was the greatest thing in the world was the automatic car garage door opener. Because every time my mom pulled up to the home, I had to get out and lift a wooden door that weighed more than the house. And, uh, and now it's digital dentistry, 3D printing, um, 3D printing and metal. So um, my gosh, what, what has got you excited about? Oh man, I mean, I just have a huge passion for the profession, you know, always have. So uh, it's it's really fortunate how things kind of worked out where I transitioned from private practice into full-time academia. I mean, I'm surrounded by a great team. I got a lot of colleagues and uh, now is a really, really exciting time in dentistry. Things are moving fast, you know, innovation is moving at lightning speed. We can't always forget those fundamentals and principles, but it's exciting. There's so much to do, so much to discover, so much to improve upon. I mean, sleep gets in the way. I mean, when these little kids tell me that they love technology and they love all things, you know, Apple and their Mac, and I say, well, man, if you love digital, if you love digital, you need, you need to go into dentistry because it, it's going from, yeah, I mean, it's going all high tech. But I but I got I to gotta tell you the, the dark side, it's, this is dentistry uncensored. A lot of these kids come out of school in America from private schools that cost $100,000 a year. And they say, um, come on, Les, I'm $400,000 in student loans. If I buy a CBCT, a Lenap laser, and a CAD cam, I just double my student loan debt. So they're always wondering if you're $400,000 in debt, does any of this technology, is it bleeding edge? Is it leading edge? Does any of it have a return on investment so that someday they can pay off their student loans? Uh, I think you hit the nail right on the head, the return on investment. You know, if you're talking to a new grad, I think the important part is to work on your skill set. It takes a number of years to, to really tune those in. So again, back to fundamentals, principles, work on patient communication, work on learning your skill set, learn, learn, we'll start working on treating every patient like they're a family member, and that skill set is just gonna be honed right in. You, you know, technology is very, very challenging. You don't want to, you know, dump in for a five, 10 year loan and have that unit sitting there. So it really depends on where you're practicing, what kind of patients you're working on and how much you're going to utilize it. You don't want to use it as a coat rack in the corner of your office and then you got monthly payments going on it. So students got to be really diligent. New grads have to be really diligent. Um, maybe the best idea is for a multi-practice clinic where they share the costs, you know, and get into it slowly. The key that I find if someone's going to get into digital dentistry 
is to make sure that it improves the experience for both the patient and the clinician. Well said, and that is what, it's so funny because so so many of these people that are so anti-DSOs and all that kind of stuff are the ones telling everybody they should have a CIRAC machine for 140, a CBCT for 100, a a LENAP laser for 135, a water lace for 135, and it's like, and that is what drove group practice in medicine. I mean, when they started coming out with MRIs and CAT scan, well, you can't buy an MRI for a solo practicing physician. You had to share that with a group. So when I talk to healthcare economists, they say what drove group practice more than anything in our physicians was to share the technology. And that's what you're saying, that that with this shared technology, that you might need to buy this and have several people use it. Yeah, just step back and look at the numbers. You know, uh, it's just arithmetic. So, you know, my oldest is talking about uh, buying a car. Great, let's sit down, you know, let's talk about how much is the car? What's gonna be the insurance? What's gonna be the gas? And how much is he gonna use it? You know, we didn't have Uber back in our day. So if he needs to take 100 Ubers a year and he's saving half the money by doing that, then maybe that's the economical he should go at. I think clinicians need to be the same way. They need to be really, really diligent about what they're getting into. Whether whether it is a CBCT machine or whether it is a five-year subscription to an implant company, make sure that you're not buying in for the sake of buying in, that it's a pragmatic decision. And I recommend Lyft over Uber. You said Uber, but Lyft um, is about 80% of the drivers are women. So who would you want to pick you up and give you a ride? Somebody that looked like me? Or some woman. Uh, so I, I uh, and Lyft is going to do an IPO. Um, so what technology do you think um, is here today that will show a return on investment? I mean, is it oral scanners, CAD cam, CBCT? What What do you think is a buy? Oral scanners. I think digital impressions. I really do. Um, it's just, uh, again, for students, because I'm in academia, or new clinicians, there's that learning curve. You know, if uh, if you and I are going snowboarding and you're a world class snowboarder, I might not hone those skills in our first afternoon session together. You know, it's going to take me some time. So just it, it, there's a learning curve to it. And then they have to find a way to implement it into their practice. You know, back in our day, we had the E4D. So I'm dating myself. But that had to be done in a certain particular way. If you were doing same day crowns on individuals, the workflow is completely different. You know, your scheduling is completely different. So, again, I recommend to um, young clinicians, try it out. You know, book a book an evening with uh, one of the reps at a dental company. Try it out. See if it fits. Know that you're going to have that learning curve. Um, if you're in the implant world, yeah, I think um, CBCT is so important. I mean, it's almost regulatory in some areas. So, I think that's critical. After that, you just got to look at your time and see what improves the experience, what's going to save you time. Time is money in dentistry, something that's going to give you increased predictability. But again, I can't stress, do not forget the fundamentals and principles. You know, I don't know how many times I've bumped in to a colleague somewhere telling me a story where it had this great implant case and the surgical stent is printed and they tried it in the mouth and they had trismus and they could only about open about 25, 30 millimeters. So just remembering the workflow and that technology really um, just improves it. It doesn't, it doesn't correct it. That's the key. You've been involved with the Standards Council of Canada. Are, do you think CBCT is the standard of care with them as far as placing an implant? How, how does the Standards Council of Canada view that decision? <sighs> you know, they, they wouldn't, what they're looking at is making sure that if you buy a unit that all the standards are the same. And I believe that CBCT is standardized. So whether you buy X or Y, the quality of the image is standardized. That's the key there. They wouldn't comment on whether or not a profession would make it the standard of care. That's up to our regulatory. So um, by no means do I want to speak speak for our regulatory, the RCDSO. Um, I think what they've done is they presented guidelines that really puts the onus on the clinician saying you need to take adequate records to make a reasonable decision in diagnosis and treatment planning. And that way each clinician kind of gets to pick what they need to do. We know that dentistry is patient specific. So instead of setting out just a black and white standard, um, you get to make that decision. And I just want to say to all my homies who uh, have so many opinions on different countries, never been there. I've, 
I've lectured in Canada a hundred times in the last 30 years, I think. So here's the cheat sheet on Canada. It's basically California. They're both the same size. They both have the same number of people, the same GDP, the same number of dentists. Um, the only thing different between Canada and the United States is they have the highest percentage of PhDs of any country in the world. They're just smarter, more intelligent. So if Canada says, uh, do this, um, you listen to Canada, you don't listen to uh, where I was born in Kansas that still teaches um, evolution. I mean, they're just really, really smart people. And Canada did the single greatest move in my lifetime. When the uh, when the lease on Hong Kong expired and um, you had all these self-made millionaires and billionaires, they all wanted to leave um, Hong Kong before it went, returned to China. Um, the United States, you know, they've been anti-immigration since the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917 when they closed down Ellis Island and Vancouver said, hey, come on down. Oh my God. It seems like every single person that came from Hong Kong uh, to Canada, uh, brought with them a degree, a lot of money, a lot of skill sets. I mean, I just think, uh, in fact, if you ask me what my favorite city in North America is, it's Vancouver, British Columbia. I mean, it's just a rocking hot town. Um, back to um, what I like about oral scanners, maybe I'm biased because I'm old. Um, I got five grandkids, but when I scan orally, I get to see my prep 40 times larger. And I don't know if it's affects millennials the way it does because I don't remember what it was like to look when at a tooth when I was 25. But man, when you see your prep 40 times, uh, every every time I see my initial prep and I go to scan it, uh, I think my license should be taken away. I mean, it's just a horrific, embarrassing time. And then and then you're grabbing for sandpaper disc and end cutting burr. You're trying to just salvage this prep that looks like Stevie Wonder cupped the whole thing. And, and same with loops. I mean, I go into dental offices and the dentist has loops, um, but his hygienist and assistant doesn't. It's like anybody working on a human. I mean, magnification is just the lowest hanging fruit to increase your quality. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, I've, I grew up with magnification right from dental school, so that was a given, but absolutely. I mean, when I remember scanning our first preps with the E4D, and now you see it on a screen that's whatever it was back in the day, 14 by 16, I had to go back and go, you got to be kidding me. I mean, it looks like the Grand Canyon. That's not a margin. And it really does change the way you prep a tooth, you know. Um you know, it's an, that's an interesting topic you mentioned there because the key again, when um, you got to remember, most of my time is with um, senior dental students, third and fourth year. The second you pop it under magnification, it just goes off. You know, they, they see it; it's right there. You know, they can they can assess it and see it, but a, a lot of them don't know that you have to evaluate it like that, whether it's the prep or the cast. So. Again, when we did our little uh, digital dentistry elective with the students, that's one of the things that came out is, does my prep look like that? And uh, I think it's important. I think it's important to realize that you might have to change your delivery of dentistry for the modality that you're going down. And the number one cause of endo failure is just missing a canal or missing a bunch of material. You didn't reach the tipping point of debriding it enough. And all the great endodontists I know, they all have a $25,000, the one out of uh, St. Louis Global uh, Microscope, and they're only using it at 8X. But they say once every day or every other day, they're doing a molar every hour, they, they, they go to just check it before they obturate it. And sure enough, there's a canal they missed or they thought everything was clean and one of the canals still has a bunch of stuff in it. And so just magnification is everything. When you were doing the CBCT and you were using E4D and the big one is uh, Densply married, um, Densply and Serona got married, they have the CEREC machine. You know, all the people teaching CEREC say, you know, they, they can prep, scan, mill and deliver in an hour. But I just never saw that in private practice. How long do you think the reality is when you decide instead of taking an impression and sending it to a lab or an oral scanner and send it to a lab, but just to scan and mill it out and do all that in the office. So how long do you think that appointment is? Longer than an hour, Howard. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, you know, when you get to the milling, you hope that everything mills properly, right? You hope that the communication's there, you hope that the prep comes out, you know, you hope the burrs don't collide. But then when you get to the staining and glazing, that might take a little bit of time. So um, we, we didn't offer that workflow that often in our office. We really like to prep, provisionalize, do our work, and then bring the patients back. Again, if you're a GP and you're doing general dentistry and you're seeing kids in geriatrics and you're doing endos and you're doing removable, that workflow is very, very challenging. I found it anyway to implement 
okay, because uh, things do go sideways, and schedules are tight, and your first available is not for a season away, and it just brings another layer of stress that uh, we weren't ready to deal with. So a lot more than an hour, that's for sure. And what I don't like is the emotional commitment. So if, if Les has come in my office and I've spent two and a half hours on a molar and I go to deliver it and it's just not quite right, I don't have the guts to tell Les, uh, Les, this isn't perfect. Um, and so you just think, oh my God, I can't tell him that. I'm just, I'm just going to cement it. Uh, whereas some, someone comes in for a crown seat. Um, on those, um, when you talk about oral scanners, it seems like the winner of that game is Three Shape out of Copenhagen, Denmark with their trios. Um, I know Align Technology owns Invisalign, Nitero, 3M, which is very close to where you live. In Minneapolis, St. Paul, they own uh, True Deaf. Which oral scanner do you think is better than the other? If, if they're listening to you right now and they're saying, come on, guy, which one would you recommend? Oh, boy. I would recommend the one that fits your needs. How's that for a nice diplomatic answer? Are you, run, are you running for politician of the year? <laughs> I am not, but, you know, it's, it's one of those ones where um, if you like all the bells and whistles and you can afford – the heated seats and all that stuff, go for it. Again, just make sure you utilize it. Make sure there's no surprises, you know. Um, are there export fees, monthly subscription fees, that kind of stuff. Make sure that it's still keeping you profitable. Um, on the flip side, if you want to enter into the world of, you know, digital scanners and try it out, you're not worried about color and all the bells and whistles, and maybe one that's less expensive, that's a little more affordable, get you in the door. And then again, you hone your skills, you refine your craft, and then you go back to the market and see if you want to upgrade. So that's that's kind of my angle. Do you think the the fact that the 3M True Def needs powder, do you think that's a big deal or do you think that's, because you know all the people competing against them are going to say, oh, well, you're going to have to use powder. Do you, do you think the powder with the True Def is a big deal or do you just think it's what the three shape and Invisalign and iTero people are just going to say? I think it's if 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 it fits a big deal to the clinician or the patient, then it's going to be a big deal. You know, it's a pretty simple side procedure step. Um, you know, they've got some studies on it's just titanium dioxide, so we're not really worried about things too much. It takes a reflective coating off. Again, I'm not I'm not advocating for them, but I'm just saying it again. It just boils down to how busy you are. You know, if you're seeing sixty patients a day and you're whacking out crowns and bridges left and right, then maybe that little detour is just way too much for you and if you're a comfortable gp and you have a good balance it might not make any difference if your patients aren't too concerned and they trust the literature then i don't think it'd be a big deal yeah i just i just think um every single laboratory i know says that when they were working with a dentist for a decade and that dentist was averaging five to six percent remakes when they started doing oral scanners um it dropped to one percent i don't know if that's because um, the magnification, the dentist just made a better prep. Um, but gosh, I mean, think of, think if you bought, went to oral scanning and four out of every hundred crown seats want to re-impress. And I mean, that, that, that alone would that, make you want to buy it, wouldn't it? Win-win. And I mean, all my, time. all my friends in Phoenix. And when I say friend, I mean, an alcoholic that likes to go drinking with me, watching sports games and eating cheeseburgers. Um, the only thing they use their uh, E4D or their Serona for is the the scanner. I mean, yeah. they they just they just start scanning, and the ones that do mill it out, you know what they do? They mill it out. They they, they scan it, and then they temporize it, and then at the end of the week, they have a lab tech come in their office and mill out all the crowns they did for the week uh, to cement the next yep. week. But none of them are doing it in the office. Three D printing is that is that. What's, you know, is that five, 10 years down the road? Is that bleeding edge or leading edge? Where's 3D printing at in 2019? I think it's now. Yeah, this is happening. This is, this reminds me because I have a little bit of uh, experience in photography. This, remember when the digital cameras came around and we we're talking about the film users were saying, ah, oh, this is, this is a fad. It's going to come and go and look what it did. Um, I have a feeling it's going to have the same impact. You know, Everything that you and I have learned about in terms of our preparations, material thickness, how much we have to reduce something was based on those prostheses, based on the manufacturing process. Can we agree? Yes. If if 3D printing is going to give us what we need with a whole different set of physical properties, that might really change how we go back and prep. So we're fortunate enough to work with a wonderful company called Adidas. 
Um, they're just outside of uh, our university gates. Adidas? And they house a couple. A D I A S? A D E I S S. Okay. And uh, they house a couple of Renishaw printers, so we've been fortunate enough to work with them. And our little research uh, approach, we're investigating 3D printing a novel dental implant abutment. So we can appreciate that the dent dental implant abutment is just so tiny and, and minimal, and how can we do it? Um, we just got some of the preliminary data back, and we are absolutely blown out of the water with some of the strengths that this material has. So, again, just um, – digital workflow that we've been used to in dentistry that's really taken over but now your output is different we're doing it with the additive manufacturing the exact opposite of what we've been doing for the last 20 years with CAD CAM throwing away 75 percent of the material that we didn't need and uh, very exciting I think it's here I think it's here to stay um, it's funny you mention that I'm going to be chairing a 3d printing conference in Amsterdam in September and we're putting together a real interesting host of speakers uh, bringing in lithos to talk about ceramic 3d printing i'll be talking about 3d printing in titanium and anyone interested reach out to me but just a really fun avenue that i think is going to have a real impact so what are you excited about in 3d printing what is it is it is it fillings crowns impressions surgical splints what what has um got you excited the fillings yes i'm pretty excited about the fillings to see if we can venture down a new material um dental implant abutments absolutely Okay, new avenue for production. Anything that gives us a patient-specific dental device excites me. You know, we can really get dentistry into that patient-specific spectrum. And just the workflow is, when you have a dental workflow, it's so accommodating. You know, you try something, you print it out. If you need to tweak it, you just go to a screen. It's like adjusting a photo in Lightroom. It's so, it's so fun. And uh, it's just... A nice workflow. So I like everything about it. And when you're um, when you're looking at 3D printing, um, they're also starting to do that with metal. Yeah, so this is the one we're working with. We're actually printing in titanium. Printing in titanium. Yes. Now, uh, so that's for the, um, is that for the implant or just the implant abutment? Implant abutment. So you, you can appreciate how tiny we're talking about. I remember when I was uh, lecturing in Copenhagen, like, oh, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, maybe it was 10 years, I'm not sure. And I was with them, they said, well, what would you like to do with this? And I said, well, after I extract the tooth, I'd like to scan the socket. And back then I just knew of CAD CAM. And I said, and mill out an implant. Instead of, instead of you know, I pull out this three-rooted tooth and then I have to place an implant that's a cylinder. Yep. Um, how, how Do you think that's, uh, how far away is it from extracting a tooth? Because you wouldn't even need a CBT if you just extracted the socket and then CAD CAM printed a titanium custom implant. You still probably need your radiographic data so that we can design and mill something socket specific. Um, I don't know. You know, whenever you talk about new technology, it's not always what's better. It's also what industry is ready to bring on, you know? So that's, that's a tough one. Um, is it possible? Absolutely. Is it predictable? Most likely. Will it revolutionize things? I don't have the answer to that. You're also involved with the Shulik Medicine and Dentistry, dental research at Shulik Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, you're on their video on YouTube. Uh, what is that? So we, our faculty, of we have a school of medicine and dentistry. So medicine and dentistry are together. Uh, the dean of medicine oversees the entire school. We have a director for dentistry. Um, that's, our, that's our academic unit. So that's where the students go for dentistry. That's where I teach. And we're fortunate enough to have uh, some very amazing research facilities to work at. And you're also the director of outreach, social responsibility. When I, I tell dentists all the time that in the United States, there's never been a dentist who's been in, in the president executive house or the judicial Supreme Court, but there's four dentists who are in Congress right now. One of them um, I went to Creighton with, um, Paul Gosar, Creighton University from Flagstaff, practice in Flagstaff. Uh, there's another one from Idaho, Texas. And um, when they... When anybody's talking about dentistry, they're always talking about, is it available? Is it affordable? Um, so what are your thoughts on social responsibility and what are you doing with your outreach program? Is dentistry available and affordable to 38 million Canadians? Short answer, no. 
that's the short answer. So again, we're a little bit different south of the border, north of the border. Um, you know, we, we kind of have universal health care. We're aware of that. But dentistry is still a uh, fee for service. Okay. There are social programs in place. All right. There's some for kids. There's some for veterans. There's some for different economic groups. But there is still um, a large chunk of the marginalized population that can't get access to care. So, you know, you're sitting there with a sore throat. I'm sitting here a little bit tired. You know, we're, we're trudging through. Imagine what it's like sitting there with an abscess tooth now for three months that's killing you, that you can't eat or drink. You wouldn't be sipping your drink. And you don't have enough money to go to the dentist to get it looked after. In fact, you haven't been in 10 years and you don't want to go. So how do we reach out to the, that population? And that's kind of what we do with my dental outreach. The program's called Docs. And we really service that population that has no other opportunity. So lower income, limited access, limited funds, and we provide them dental treatment. So we actually go into the community. We pack up a truck. We drive to a community agency, pick one, Salvation Army, uh, Boys and Girls Club. We'll set up a small mobile clinic in that facility, and then we're gonna invite those patients that are having these problems in, in an area that they're aware of. And we meet them, we greet them, we diagnose and treatment plan them, and then we make that connection. And then we say, see you later, and we invite them back to the dental school, and we deliver treatment. And that's what we've been doing. I've been doing that now for about uh, eight years. The program's 10 years old, and uh, it's been amazing. It's been very rewarding. You know, it was Winston Churchill after World War II that said, we're not going to build a great country if everybody's sick and uneducated. So the first thing he wanted to do is get everybody well. And you're so right. I mean, in America, there's about 60 to 80,000 personal bankruptcies a year. And the number one cause is health care. Winston Churchill also said that Americans will always do the right thing after exhausting all the alternatives. And um, you're up there with socialized medicine. And I know my homies. I mean, I've lectured a thousand times in America. And when you say socialized medicine, uh, they're going to just, they're just going to, they're going to shoot you. Um, so what, so you're a, a, one of their homies, you're a dentist, um, you're like them. Um, do you have a different view of socialized medicine than 80% of all the dentists um, listening to this podcast in America? Maybe I just have a different connection. You know, it's, um, here's the deal. Um, I, I grew up you know, with a single parent family and we were marginalized. So maybe my exposure, my awareness of problems that face those populations is a little more personal. Okay. And uh, being able to give back to the communities that I grew up in is very rewarding. You know, even, even a private practice, let's not talk about dental outreach. Let's talk about private practice. We made it kind of our mission to see, you know, a dozen patients a year that could not afford treatment and we just deliver treatment to them. You know, whatever the reason was, if they couldn't meet their needs, uh, everyone has a story. Everyone goes through hardships. It's nice to give back. We have that ability and we've made some absolutely fantastic friendships over the years. So for me, there's definitely a personal tangent, you know, um, it's rewarding and it's, let me tell you, it's really heartbreaking to bump into a classmate from public school or high school and you're providing treatment and they're getting treatment, you know, just open your eyes that, uh, not everyone is at the same level and it's nice to give back. You know, I, when I, I grew up in a, you know, I went to a Catholic, you know, school from first grade to end of uh, Creighton university. And my, my favorite nun was, uh, and my two older sisters are Catholic nuns and, my favorite nun was Mother Teresa Calcutta, and I always thought that the one insightful thing she would say is that a lot of times Americans think, well, it, with this idea, you can't help everyone. And Mother Teresa would always say, I don't care if you can't help everyone, help one. And if you have extra time, maybe you can help two, but you don't, but when you start thinking in absolutes, people just throw in the towel. They say, well, you can't help everyone. Well, just because you can't help everyone doesn't mean that you can't help one person. And uh, yeah, um, it's, it's a, uh, that is such an emotional issue. I don't know why that is such an emotional issue. Cause when I go to the greatest civilizations like Canada, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, I mean, just the greatest countries in the world, they all provide basic health care for their people. Because um, I, I, I was reading a story here in Arizona where this, some, some guy was a um, cutting palm trees he, in Arizona. He fell out of the palm tree, hurt his back. And a year later, he still couldn't get out of bed because he yeah. can't afford it. Well, you don't, you can't build a great country if your buddy 
can't get out of bed for a year and there's a treatment exactly. for that. And whatever you spent on his treatment, I'm sure he would pay back in tax dollars eventually um, because uh, economics, but I, I don't want to, um, but I but I know it's emotional and I don't have a single dentist friend um, in Arizona who um, agrees with your system on that deal. I mean, I'm just, uh, none of them agree. It's just so um, emotional. Um, so um, I want you to switch gears since you're in dental school, and you've been yes. watching graduates come out. And since um, all the old people like me read textbooks and all the young people read um, digital digital books. Um, so all the podcasters are pretty much millennials. In fact, shoot me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com and tell me how old you are. Do you know what it's going to be? It's going to be 30 and under. And uh, or if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, put a comments in the uh, comments afterwards. And thank you so much for the 10,000 um, people who follow uh, this show on uh, YouTube under uh, Dental Town. But what advice would you give uh, to dental graduates? What, what, what patterns of success have you seen with graduating classes where dental graduates do better five, 10 years out of school since you've been in there versus other behaviors that don't lead to success? So what advice can I give to new grads? Ah, I would have to step back and just say, take your time, have some patience. You know, there's, um, there's this, this rush, this FOMO, let's get going, let's get moving. Dentistry is very different. I think any time that you're using your hands to deliver treatment, everyone has a different skill set. And, you know, dental students are brilliant students, okay? It's not easy to get into dental school. So they've done really, really well in high school. They've done really, really well in undergrad, and they're probably doing really well in dental school. But some things will take a little longer than others to have that skill acquisition. So take the time, you know, take the time with working on CE to complement what you need to fill in the, the gaps where you're lacking. Um, have a mentorship program with a few dentists to see where they're at, what they've done. You know, um, don't dive into life head first so that you have a million dollars debt. There's no reason to buy a practice right away and get married and have two kids and a dog. Take your time. It's a very, very enjoyable and rewarding profession, but you got to live within your means. You know, I had the benefit of uh, back in our, our day in dental school, we had two weeks where we could shadow, observe, assist, whatever you want to call it, some of the specialists in town. So I'm in fourth year, so I'm thinking I'm, you know, I'm God's gift to dentistry at this point. I'm probably taking, you know, six hours to do a crown prep and impress. And I was invited to um, watch Dr. Ken Hubble, who I think might be living in Arizona right now. And I watched Ken him Hubble? prep. Ken Hubble. Ken Hubble. How do you spell his last name? H-E-B-E-L. H-E-B-E-L. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. But, there we go. But you had a chance. So uh, we, we had a chance to go to his, I had a chance to go to his office and watch him prep, impress, and provisionalize probably eight or 10 units in the maxilla in about two hours and change. And let me tell you, did it ever change my perspective on the profession? You know, I knew that you had a specialist that was top in his field and I could see what level he was at and what it did is just raise the bar for me. It let me know how much higher I had to reach. And I've done that with everything that I've done, you know, whether it's implant dentistry, prosthodontics, digital dentistry, find a good mentor, connect with them and try to follow those steps. There's no quick fix. There's no, you know, check in the box faster than you can. Take your time and enjoy it. And he has the hands-on training institute right here in he Scottsdale. Does. Yeah, I've been fortunate enough to be in that back in the, uh, I'm dating myself here, the 90s, but uh, amazing. So um, I really respect Ken Hebel and I really respect what he does. And I've been fortunate to, um, you know, work with him and watch him. And uh, new grads need that. They need that. So do you still, um, do you still, uh, are you still buddies with him? We're, we, we might shoot an email here and there. You know, but uh, no, we don't. We we've drifted. You know, he's moved out outside of London, so I don't come to Arizona that often, to be honest with you. Well, statistically, I don't know if you know this, but ten percent of the homes in Phoenix, Arizona, are owned by Canadians. Um, it is um, if you're east of the Mississippi River, you go to Florida, yeah. and if you're west of the Mississippi River or Canadian, you come to Arizona. And I mean, my gosh, 
And it's funny because most of the Americans don't fly the flag when they're here, but um, maybe a couple of holidays. But the Canadians always fly the maple leaf. It's because it's a social deal. It's letting all the other Canadians know where you are. And uh, they're just, uh, they're great people. And uh, my gosh, and a lot of them, a lot of them when they um, come down for the winter, uh, do not fly because if you've ever driven from like Edmonton to Phoenix, it's a thousand miles through Idaho and Utah and the Grand Canyon. And the first time I ever drove to Canada, I packed up a, um, I uh, bought a SU, uh, an RV, put my four boys in there. I think they were like 10, eight, six. And we drove up to Edmonton and it, w- it was like, you thought you were on another planet half the journey. <laughs> So if you're Canadian, uh, you'll be living here eventually someday. So you and Kenneth will hook back up someday. Um, uh, Yeah. yeah, So, so what they do on the real estate is it's all, it's all based on the, the U S dollar to the Canadian dollar. And whenever the Canadian dollar goes up and the American dollar goes down, they all pour into real estate down here and then it reverses. It'll be on a a slow, but right now it's, it's about 10%. Um, so which, which is just, uh, amazing. So I, I gotta ask you, um, the, the two things that I like when I look at patterns of success, um, so many, when you, when you go to countries like Japan and, and, uh, France and England, where the government reimburses you so low for a filling that you can't hardly do fillings, exams, cleans, and x-rays, but all these countries don't set fees on implants or ortho. So when you look at the most profitable procedure, it's always the implant part of the business or the and the um, the orthodontic Invisalign. And you are a little, um, you have so many credentials in implant dentistry. So what would you say to a new graduate? Um, I've always said they should add a new specialty at least every five years. Um, what specialty would you recommend they add first out of dental school and they get their skill set up of doing fillings, crowns, and then they're getting, you know, their patient skills and they're starting to hum along. Um, would it be implants or ortho? Invisalign or implants? Which one do you think is a better return on investment? You, you got a biased guy here. I got to go implants. You know, it's uh, – <laughs> It's the gold standard to replace a tooth. I don't usually use the term gold standard, but I think it's a gold standard. But the science is just moving so quickly. You know, there's so many advances. And, you know, a lot of geographical locations are really changing their guidelines from regulatory. So we have that now, where if you're going to be restoring implants, you need a certain amount of CE. And if you're going to be surgically placing them, you need a certain amount of CE. So um, until dental schools kind of keep up with what's current, that's definitely what I'd recommend. And then they're going to ask you, I mean, right now, as we speak, the IDF meeting is going on in Cologne, Germany, and you don't even want to know how many implant companies bought a booth there this week. We have the editor of Dental Town Magazine uh, there right now, and um, Tom Giacobbe, and I mean, there's almost 400 different companies. So she's driving to work right now, and she doesn't want to go figure out 400 different companies. She wants to know what company do you recommend and why? Well, taking my diplomatic stance, Howard, you know what I say is uh, get involved with an organization first. Forget about the company. Join an organization. You got so many good ones to choose from. You get AO. You got the ICOI, which I, I've been a member for almost 20 years now that I think is so worthwhile. Um, join join one. You know, get to network. Get, get a few mentors. See what's out there. When you go to these um, – Conventions, conferences, for instance, the ICOI was just in Phoenix. You're going to have a ton of implant companies there. They're going to have their surgical platform. So their restorative platform. Go, ask questions, try things out. Don't always look at the cost factor. Look at something that's predictable, that has a lot of studies behind it. But maybe if for you know the restorative dentist, the restorative platform that's nice and easy. So get out there, check ones out, see what fits your needs, and then make a decision. You know, dentists are... They're smart people. They can make good decisions. They just have to do a proper due diligence. I got to tell you the funniest story about that meeting in Scottsdale. I wasn't even thinking about that. And um, um, I decided uh, me and the president of our company, Lori, um, we're going to go to dinner. And uh, we went there and didn't even know that meeting was there. And we hadn't even ordered appetizers. And every five minutes, some dentist was walking over to our table saying, oh, my God. You know, it was so much fun. Um, There's so many meetings going on all the time. You just don't even know where they're all going. When they come out of school, they want to get an associate job. 
Well, there's two types of dentists in my mind. There's the ones who love blood and guts, like me. You can even see it in their endo. When they do a fill, they want to be apical barbarians, get to the very end and get a puff of sealer out. And then you got the people yep. who are, um, you know, light and fluffy. They like bleaching, bonding veneers. They respect the last millimeter of the canal chamber and they're pulp lovers, I call them. Um, so if you're a pulp lover and you want to do bleaching, bonding veneers and, and Invisalign, that's a business model. But I guarantee yep. you the blood and guts dentist that can do molar endo, extract a painful tooth and place an implant those people build practices on average twice as big as the pulp lovers. So are you an apical barbarian when it comes to endo and like that puff of sealer, or are you a pulp lover and want to respect the last millimeter? Well, I did GPR. I did a GPR <laughs> under two amazing oral surgeons. We did hospital dentistry. I maintain hospital privileges, so I think you know. Um, I really enjoy surgery. You know, it's funny, I enjoy both ends, but I definitely lean towards that. And I think you made a really nice point. You know, if if we talk about what new grads should focus on, it's their skill set. Okay, you can go really anywhere to get your teeth white. You can probably you can do it online now, right? In five more years, you can do everything online. But if you have a colleague referring a friend to you for your skill set, those are the best practice builders that will never go away. You know, people tend to see people for what they can deliver, for their touch, for their bedside manner, for their fit. And I think that's an important part of dentistry that we can't forget. I want to talk about something else, a totally different subject. You know, the American Dental Association recommend, uh, recognizes nine specialties. And everybody wants to talk about the orthodontist, the oral surgeon, the pediatric dentist. No one wants to talk about public health dentist. And nobody ever talks about dental school instructors. Now that I'm 50, I'm class of 87, I've had two classmates of mine after had the most amazing practice for 30 years in St. Louis, Becky Sissel decided, you know what, my, I'm, I'm gonna go to teach. And then now Brad Gettleman, who was single-handedly the greatest endodontist in Arizona for three decades, um, decided he's, he'd rather go teach endo. What was it, it like going from private practice uh, to teaching the next generation? What made you go back to dental kindergarten and decide you wanted to babysit <laughs> the kids? This uncensored? Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, th this is a real, and I'll have to meet you one day. It's a real interesting story how, how this precipitated. But um, my private practice, I really enjoy treating patients, but we started doing some research. And believe it or not, the research part was going really strong. It was a lot of fun. And so we had a real interesting balance. I was one, one of the few dentists, and I'm not trying to toot my own horn. It was just a workflow. And so the opportunity to go to dental school um, primarily was related to some of the research that I was involved with. So that, that was a nice step in. So that was always nice. Um, the second part, Howard, is back in 03, I did some outreach dentistry in Ecuador. And again, it strung a real good nerve. And I came back and did some, uh, some public service announcements and saying how we should do it. And when the school was looking at outreach, I think my name came to mind. So that was there. Um, but returning to academia from private practice, first of all, hats off to all my private clinician colleagues because that is a day of work. We forget what it's like, okay? You come in, you start early, you work late, you squeeze in a bathroom break, it's busy, busy, busy. Um, academia is much more balanced and it tends to come in, in different waves, you know, but it's it's challenging. It has its challenges too, you know. Um, generationally, I'm starting to be a little disconnected from the dental students. So, you know, I try to stay young and, and try to be a, a front on, figure out what things they're watching and what things they're doing, incorporate them into the teachings. And they have their unique challenges of getting into dental school, getting out, and then practicing. So um, it has just been such a um, – challenging yet rewarding approach that I never thought it would be. But the, to have an impact on dental students and you bump into them at a conference or they email you and they remember that tidbit that you told them, it's it's pretty unique. You know, dentistry is wonderful. You get to improve people's lives through, you know, delivering treatment. But dental education is, uh, for the ones that it fits well with, it's amazing. Uh, I want to switch gears completely because – Humans yep. are visual animals. All the apes and primates are visual and they see, they, they understand with their eyes. 
and birds and reptiles are sound. I mean, when those birds set up in the canopy and they hear all those chirping, that makes sense to them. It doesn't. And when you look at the average dental website, for every 100 people that go to the website, only one to three convert and call the office. But who's converting the most people from website to calling is if I'm going to go to your office because I got a loose denture and I'm thinking about implants, I want to see your photos of your work on your website. And you're an accredited uh, photojournalist. Um, what advice, first of all, what is a Moto GP photojournalist? And what advice would you give some kid? Because I, I, I when people start talking about technology, the cheapest piece of technology you can get is a digital camera and put your own work on your website. And um, by the way, I want to tell you, on Dental Town, the dentist where have used that has photos of his before and after implant cases or braces or whatever, and it says this is um, this is Les's own work. I mean, they have people jumping on Southwest Air Airlines and flying from Parsons, Kansas to Oklahoma City. Uh, so tell us, what is a Moto GP photojournalist? And what advice could you give some young dentist that needs to start photo documenting their cases from silver fillings to tooth colored fillings, uh, braces, yeah. implants? What, 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 what is a Moto GP photojournalist? Okay, do you see that there? You see it? Hold on, I don't know if you can see oh, it. Oh, yeah. So, Moto GP is the pinnacle of motorcycle racing. So, these are the guys that go around tracks when they swing their leg around their bike. Uh, they're risking their life every race. And they're going anywhere up to 350 kilometers an hour going around these tracks. Okay. And they go to different tracks. You know, they had just one in. Um, uh, in the Middle East, they're off to South America, they'll be in Texas for that one. So that's MotoGP, so the pinnacle of motorcycle racing. So I'm a motorcycle enthusiast, and over the years I've had the opportunity to be an accredited MotoGP photojournalist, which was, um, you know, kind of a life, one of my bucket listers. So I got to go to these races and photograph these amazing riders and interview them and do stories and just kind of compliment my other portfolio with this. I mean, it's a passion and I love it. Now, it's not easy taking these photos. I'm going to be honest. You need the right gear. Okay. These guys are going fast. You got uh, a second to get an image. You got to edit your photos. You got to get them off to the editor. It's a whole different workflow, but it really sets the tone nicely that if you're going to be taking images of a patient that's not moving, that's static, that's laying there, you can really tell your colleagues that it's not difficult to take images of dental things. So I'm with you 100% on I think dentists need to um, document things digitally. So the one thing they should do is probably stop taking photos with their iPhone and just buy a camera, buy a mirrorless camera. A get mirrorless? The basic, get a mirrorless camera, yeah. Okay. You know, and, and the reason I say that, it's – Everyone, everyone's taking photos with their iPhone. I do the same. But when we're talking about patient cases, we're talking about records and we're talking about security and we're talking about privacy. And what you want to do is you want to get a dedicated camera where you take those images and they're not clouded and they're not on your device so that if you leave your phone out or someone gets hacked, people are not seeing that Jim's wearing dentures. Okay, we don't want to know that. So buy a dedicated camera and just like we talked about, just work on your craft. Start give, taking give them pictures an, of Give them an exact name of a mirrorless camera to buy. Give them a name. I'm a, I'm, I'm a Canon guy. Any Canon mirrorless EOS M will work. Any of the EOS families will work. You're talking anywhere from, well, I'll go American since we're U.S. dollars, probably 300 to, to 1,500 U.S. dollars. And, and I'm telling you that, you know, that everybody's, Convert, first of all, when I go into a dental office, they don't even know what their conversion rate is. They have no idea how many people bounce off there. I mean, if I was in London, Ontario or Toronto, if I was in Toronto and I searched dentist in Toronto, how many would Google serve me up? A lot. Yeah, so, the, so, so you don't understand Tons. that. I want to call, I want to talk to a dentist. So I, I call them up and it goes to voicemail. Well, I'm not going to leave a message. I'm just going to call the next dentist. And then when they go to your website, if I want... 
a certain type of dentistry. I want something. I want to see, I mean, we, we got to build trust. You're selling the invisible. They know what an iPhone is, but they don't know if you know how to straighten teeth or do bleaching, bonding veneers or place an implant. And by the way, when you're doing these cases, don't think like a dentist. I mean, when you show a before and after implant case on grandma, they don't want to see blood and gingivas and papillas. Oh, yeah. They yeah. want to see her happy. You want the before picture where she's a little stressed or scared or not sure. And then the after she's just beaming. And that big transition is what secretes the dopamine and the serotonin. Uh, get a Canon mirrorless camera. Okay, just for the person, I got a um, Canon mirrorless camera. What What is a mirrorless yep. camera as opposed to a camera with a mirror? You remember the big mirrored cameras we've been using with the lenses and the ring flashes are like this big? We've taken the mirror out of it. So it's a lot more compact. It's about as thick as maybe two iPhones together. Still has lenses that are interchangeable, but now the back of the camera is just like any iPhone where you see what you're shooting in live, and most of them are touchscreen, so you can press where you want it to focus. So it, the operation is just so simple. Yeah, and I was lucky because my dental assistant for 15, 20 years, um, Christina, um, she just loves photography, and she got into it as like a, first it was a personal thing, then a private deal, then she started taking glamour photos for her friends, you know, events yep. or whatever. And it's really nice when you can get one of the wet hands. And if it's not your thing, um, maybe, um, you know, this is something that someone else in your office wants to do. Um, maybe one of your dental assistants. Um, what, what if you offer this to your dental assistant, do you, is there any online training or any, any training to learn how to use the mirrorless camera? Or would you just recommend trial and error? How would you there is so much online. I, I actually teach a course uh, both in and out outside of academia. Um, it's like a two-hour hands-on that we go over and talk about the different workflows. So uh, shameless self-promotion, but that's something I do. But there's lots out there as well. Um, let me reiterate one thing you said, though, Howard, and that is you have to show cases that you have completed. If they keep using stock photography for things Everyone's everyone knows that okay anyone can just download an image from Google Images but if you show actual patient cases and you show what you can do and the results you achieve you're right people are going to jump on planes to come and see you well I'll tell you what if you want to fill up your hands on classes you should uh, create an online uh, course for Dental Town we um we put up 417 online courses that cost about the price of a Lyft and not an Uber a lift with a really, really beautiful <laughs> woman. And, um, you know, they're like 36 bucks in the 20 richest yeah. countries. And we don't charge in the in the poor continents of the developing nations. But man, if you put an online CE course, um, would you ever consider doing that? Damn right I would. Oh yeah. my God, millennials love doing it on their iPad, their their iPhone or whatever. And it's and it's the best marketing for, for you because if they want, look at that course and then they want more, um, now, now they're turned on to you. But again, I cannot say, when it comes to marketing, most of what everybody talks about has nothing to do with marketing. What marketing is, first of all, is 39% of your calls go to voicemail. There's 168 hours in a week. You only answer your phone 32 hours. So you're missing. So 39% of your practice got a, got a uh, voicemail and went somewhere else. And then the bounce yep. rate off. I mean, if your bounce rate, let's say the bounce rate off your website, say you have a really, really good website and three out of 100 people convert. Well, you got a digital camera and took an online CE course and got that to 6% to convert, you just doubled your entire practice. And when you sit there right. telling a patient that she has that interproximal cavity is gonna need endodontic therapy and a post belt up and a full coverage, she has no idea what you're talking about. But when she sees a before and after picture, crooked teeth, sad, smile teeth. I mean, um, you know, and it's the same thing with patient reviews. You know, people get annoyed when you say, oh, will you leave our, our um, an online review on, for our website? Don't do that. Wait till they say it, say something, and then say, exactly. oh my God, I wish, instead of hearing you say that, I wish I was reading that on our Google review, our Facebook review. Is there exactly. any way you would say that again on an online review? Because that's social confirmation. But they want to see your own work. And they want to, and when yep. you have pictures, so that camera, man, this podcast, if I can get an online C course out of you on digital photography, I just hit a home run. 
Um, that is Agreed. that is amazing. What did you want to talk about that I wasn't smart enough uh, to mention? No, you hit you, you you covered it all. You're you're the magician. Well, all I want to say is about that motor spurt when you said they were going. 300 kilometers per hour i'm just want to i might not be your mom or your dad but you should never be going 300 kilometers an hour on a motorcycle so i think i should go to canada and give an online course of all the reasons they should stop doing that that is just um you remember that when you look at um climb mount everest and you see all those corpse those were all once some of the most motivated people on earth and now they're just decor on the side of the trail uh, that that's a crazy. I, I I love it when they're going around the corner and they drop their knee and they're sliding yes. their knee on the ground. They do their el elbows now. Oh my gosh! It's like, what crazy yeah. lunatic and thought of that first? Uh, it's to, you got to experience one. You got to go to Texas and see uh, Circuit of the Americas. It's up in in April. Go check it out. And then I also have to ask you, how can you morally, ethically be a dentist in Canada? and love hockey. I, isn't hockey the most anti-dental sport on earth? <laughs> Every time you see a Canadian hockey team and they pan the bench, I mean, everybody's yeah. missing half their teeth. Can you can you love hockey and be a dentist? You can love hockey and be a dentist. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Seriously, um, it was just a huge, huge honor for you to come on the show today. You have so many credentials from A to Z. Everybody loved listening to you. Les Coleman. Bachelor of Science, DDS, FAAID, Diplomat International Congress Oral and Plantology, and look for his next online course on digital photography and go out, biggest takeaway, go out and buy a Canon mirrorless camera. And when you get out of school, remember when you get out of school, it might take a year or two to really get a good photo documented before and after case of an amalgam to a composite, crooked teeth after Invisalign, replacing a missing tooth with an implant. Because I remember when I got in digital photography, you thought it was a good case until you got the pictures back. And it's like, I mean, when you're starting out, how many before and after cases do you have to do photo document in your first five years out of school before one of them is website ready? Exactly. They got to be perfect. Everything about it has to be perfect. Yeah. So get that mirrorless camera today and uh, start photo documenting your work and uh, show those people your own work. But uh, Les, thank you so much for coming on this show today. It was an honor to podcast interview you. Thanks so much, Howard. Hopefully we'll connect soon. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll retire here. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs>